So this brings us to our last section of today. So you can imagine we're looking at sort of how variables co-move with GDP, and especially this lead lag relationship, you might say, well, are there these leading variables that could lead us, allow us to predict recessions? I mean, if a variable sort of moves before GDP does, then if we saw a fall in that variable, it might help us to predict recessions. Um, and so this is a very interesting question. And one of the reasons it's very interesting is because, well, most economists failed to do this in 2008. In fact, many economists, I shouldn't say all, many economists seem to be taken by surprise by the Great Recession. And so here are just some examples. So Robert Lucas, who we've met, famous for the Lucas critique, one of these new classical economists, in 2003 said, the central problem of depression prevention has been solved. You know, all that business cycle stuff with depressions and recessions, yeah, 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 that's all gone. It's a thing of the past. We don't have to be worried about those. They don't happen anymore. In 2008, Olivier Blanchard, who is a very well-known macroeconomist, said, you know, the state of macro is good. We've got things figured out. Our models, they're great. They understand how the economy works. There's not a lot of bickering among economists like there used to be. And so we've got this, you know, basically under control. And Ben Bernanke, the former chair of the Federal Reserve, uh, in the 2000s and earlier was writing about this idea of the great moderation. This idea that, again, we've kind of, we've tamed the business cycle. We don't have recessions anymore. We don't have depressions. We figured out how to do this. Now we have this period of the great moderation. And so, not surprisingly then, economists took a lot of criticism after 2008 that they failed to predict this recession. You know, isn't that their job? And, you know, not surprisingly on the other end, a lot of economists took exception to this. I mean, no one likes being criticized, especially not for the thing that many people think you should be good at. And not least of which is the author of your textbook, uh, you know, uh, one of my co-residents of London, Ontario, and a very nice gentleman, uh, Stephen Williamson. So, in your textbook, there's a section called Macroeconomics in Action 3.1, and in it, this is a question Stephen Williamson talks about. And basically, he makes three points. I mean, I've kind of simplified them here, so I'm worried that if he saw this, he'd say I'm making somewhat of a straw man of his argument, but these are views that have been expressed by others, certainly. And so here are the three points. One, predicting recessions or financial crises is difficult, if not impossible. I mean, you can't get mad at us. These are essentially random events. And in standard macro models, that's how these are modeled, right? These are random shocks, like I talked about before. The business cycle, according to these new classical economists, are these shocks to productivity, and they're random, they're unpredictable. You know, how are we ever supposed to know? And he makes the final argument. He says, you know, if it was possible to predict recessions or financial crises, then people will be able to make a lot of money off of it. And so given that people aren't making billions of dollars off of recessions, well, then it must be that you can't predict them. And I'm going to push back a bit on this because I think that in some sense this lacks creativity the fact that we can't predict it doesn't mean that it's unpredictable. It might just mean that we're looking in the wrong places, for example. We're not looking at the right variables, maybe. And obviously, I don't know the answer, but I'll give you some ideas of what other people have said. Now, first, I'm going to address this last point that Williamson makes. He says, you know, if it was possible to predict these, then people should be able to make a lot of money off of it. Well, if any of you have seen The Big Short or read the book, and if you haven't, I recommend you do, that's exactly what it was about. It was about these people on Wall Street who around 2005 or earlier said, hey, you know, there's a lot of buildup of mortgage debt here in the US and eventually this whole thing's gonna collapse. And they, short, they, they shorted it. You know, they bet against the US housing market and they made a lot of money doing it. So evidently, some of this at least was predictable, and these people did predict it. Now, 
onto this idea that business cycle movements are random. So if we look at our graph here that I showed before of deviations of GDP from trend, yeah, this series does look kind of random, doesn't it? I mean, here below it, I've plotted a random series that I generated in MATLAB and the two look pretty similar. I mean, it does look like a random series, doesn't it? So there seems to be some credence to this, there seems to be some reason to believe it. But what about using a different definition of the business cycle? So remember that this relies on this definition of the business cycle that sees it as deviations from trend, deviations of GDP from its trend. But what about if we consider this old definition of recessions? Or that is this old definition of business cycles as, as crises, as those times when we have recessions, as those times when we have two periods or two quarters of sustained negative growth. Well, okay, let's look at our table of US recessions again that I showed earlier. Let's look at the timing of these recessions, especially starting in the 1800s here. So we have one in 1837, we have one in 1847, we have one in 1857, one in 1866, 1873, 1840, or sorry, 1884, and, you know, even in the 1900s, 1901 to 1907 to 1920 to 1930, these seem to happen about every decade. Not specifically every 10 years, but more or less, there does seem to be this regular pattern of occurrence of them. They're not happening at random intervals. Rather, they seem to be following, or, you know, at least they seem to happen at kind of well-defined intervals. Even later on, the 1970s oil crisis, a recession in the 1980s and the early 80s and the early 1990s. And so could it be that there's a crisis or a recession every decade? And what about the unemployment rate? So here's the US unemployment rate since 1970. Again, look, the spikes happen just about every 10 years. Aside from this extra one in 1975, you see one in 1970, you see one in 1980, you see one in 1990, you see one in about 2000, you see one around 2010, and by chance, there happened to be one, or there will be one this year in 2020. And so again, we seem to see these downturns about every 10 years. So could there be something to this? Is it as random as our earlier chart led us to believe? And in fact, this is not a new idea that there could be this, you know, uh, logic to when these business cycles happen. And so in 1862, we had this guy, Clément Jugler, uh, who said, you know, there's an economic cycle of, that lasts about seven to 11 years. So about the window we're seeing here. 1875, William Stanley Jevons said, you know, economic cycles, which he thought were caused by sunspots, happen every 10 and a half years. And in fact, this was an instance of very early econometrics where he tried to demonstrate this using... Uh, phase, or not phase diagrams, but um, anyways, using early econometric tools. In 1915, and then again in 1923, we have Henry Moore, who says, you know, economic cycles are about eight years long. And he said, you know, they're caused by changes in climate. And then later in 1823, he said, that's ah, probably the position of the planet Venus that's doing it. You know, these people are looking for things that happen regularly sunspots or the position of the planet Venus to explain these changes. And I should say both Jevons and Moore, this wasn't, you know, totally out there at least, you know, they had some logic behind this that had to do with changes in climate affecting crop yields and so on. And all kinds of other waves of different length have been posited. Maybe you've heard of some of them, including Kitchen, Kondratiev, or Kuznets waves. And the idea still persists today that there are these regular occurrences of, of recessions. And so in 2019, if you look at the news, all kinds of commentators are saying, you know, it's been about 10 years since the last recession. We must be due for one. Whatever due means, I don't know. But, you know, this was kind of being suggested. I mean, the re current recovery, they said, has been going on for so long. How can it persist? And in fact, this idea has been revived recently by Paul Baudry, who's now a deputy governor, I believe, at the Bank of Canada, but prior to that was a professor of economics at the University of British Columbia. 
and he said, there's something to this, you know, like there's some, you know, time dimension where these cycles tend to happen over a period of about a decade. I think he says about nine years, eight or nine years. Um, and so, for example, here's a chart he shows, right? This is quarters since last recession. So we look at a recession and then we see in the quarters that follow, what's the probability that there's another recession? And then he has here different windows in which you look. But you'll notice that when does this peak? When is the probability the highest? Well, it's around getting close to 40 quarters or about 10 years later. And then again, about 80 quarters later. So about uh, 20 years after. And this kind of confirms what we saw before. And now I should say, I should make a note here. This isn't to say that we can predict the exact date of a recession. And Stephen Williamson might claim this was his true point, is that obviously no one says I can predict the exact day a recession is going to start. And even the characters in the big short, I shouldn't say characters, these were real people. Even the people in the big short, uh, you know, were very anxious that they made these bets against the housing market, but they didn't know exactly when it was going to turn. And some of them became anxious that they were going to lose money before it turned. So obviously no one can predict the exact date. But the point here suggested by some people, including Paul Baudry, is that uh, these cycles probably have some reasonable time length to them. They're not totally random, but rather they recur in sort of uh, regular time intervals, at least probabilistically. So I say here, the idea is that it's far more likely to see a recession at certain times than others. <clears throat> now, the other part of this, this was sort of one point I wanted to make. The other point is, are there some variables that help to predict recessions? I mean, are they totally unpredictable? So let's look at one more time at our list of US recessions. So here's our table. Notice the language that's used starting in 1700. So, okay, we have one depression and then all the next sort of crises or recessions are referred to as panic, the panic of 1785, the panic of 1792, the panic of 1796, the panic of 1819 and so on, up until the depressions when suddenly the word changed the depression of 1920 and the Great Depression. And then again, we changed the word to recession. But what do we mean by panic? Why do they keep calling these panics? Well, <clears throat> they meant financial panic. These were financial crises. These were financial panics. That's why it was referred to as these, the panic of blank. <clears throat> or at least often that was the case. And that might lead us to say, should we be looking at financial variables? Could financial variables help to predict recessions? And Williamson, to his credit, notes, notes that, that stock prices are leading indicators of GDP. I mean, we saw that a few slides ago. One of the things, one of the few leading indicators of GDP are stock prices, which is a financial variable. These two guys, Moritz and Schularek, in 2012, they have a paper in which they say, you know, lag credit growth tends out to be highly significant as a predictor of financial crises. So that is, we tend to see these crises or large recessions caused by financial crises after we've had very high credit growth, very fast credit growth. And so that could be one particular predictor. And Claudio Borio, who used to be the head of the chief economist at the Bank of International Settlements, has a whole series of papers on the financial cycle, which he is a combination of credit to GDP and house prices. He creates his own variable here. And he shows that when you create a variable that way, it has very strong predictive power for recessions, or at least those caused by financial crises. And so, and you know, there are many other papers in this literature. And so these people at least would say, recessions aren't totally unpredictable. I mean, again, we can't tell exactly when they're going to happen, but we can certainly see risk factors prior to one happening that can give us some idea that one might be coming. And in particular, those risk factors are given by financial variables. Now, I have to make a few more notes here before I end. Obviously, 
financial variables aren't the only thing that can cause a recession. There could be many things. And you don't need to look anywhere else besides today, where we're going to have a recession. And it seems like, it seems very reasonable to believe that the real cause is this lockdown caused by COVID-19. And so evidently, this isn't the only thing that can explain recession. It's but one thing. <clears throat> and there could be many other things, right? But either way, you require a theory or a model of the cause of recessions, not just their outcome. And I say that because there will be many theories, and you'll see some of them, about business cycles that aren't theories of the cause of the business cycle. So for example, if our model is one where business cycles are caused by random shocks, this doesn't tell us a lot about where, you know, when a business cycle will happen and what's really causing it, it's just attributing the cause to something random. So if we want to be able to predict them, what we need is a theory that incorporates specifically the variables that are going to lead to this downturn. And so I just put that in as something to think about. And that's it for today. So it was a bit of a shorter lecture. I thought the last section uh, you might find a little interesting. It really kind of brings up some questions. Um, and so next week, we'll start with some real theory. Uh, we're going to talk about consumer and firm theory and how it's going to relate to the macroeconomic models we're going to learn. So thanks a lot.